Okay. I, I think we will start with maybe for the greater audience, the an introduction of each of us and the uh, institution we represent. And then I think I'll start with some questions. Just as a guiding, I want to make it more feel like a fire chat, uh, like you're living, sitting in my living room. You can't sit in my living room, but you can sit in my office at least, and that's my home office. So as if we're all together around the table having a, a drink and talking about renewable energy in Africa. I think that's kind of more interesting than just going to a Q&A. Probably if we can cover around 40 minutes or 45, ask the other session members if they have specific questions for us, we can also let the audience uh, participate. But I think in the beginning, it will be good to start with an introduction. So shall I start with you, Hanan, and then I'll, I'll be last. Thank you very much, Orly. So, uh, you asked me to introduce myself. Yourself uh, and the company you are representing on this. Okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you. So, Hanan Morshid, I'm a, a VP of uh, in charge of sustainability platform within OCP. OCP is the, the largest fertilizer producer in the world. So, we produce fertilizers. Our, our slogan is feeding the world, uh, feeding the soil to feed the planet. And uh, uh, you know that we have in Morocco, we are mainly based in Morocco, and we in Morocco we have access to 75% of the whole phosphate uh, world reserves. So this makes us as a custodian of phosphates and like serving the world with these natural resources that you, we, uh, Morocco have been blessed with. Uh, we started mining, uh, um, mining uh, operations since uh, uh, 1920. This year is our century anniversary, uh, so we started many operation in, in 1920, and then we shifted to uh, transform phosphate to fertilizers since 1965. Uh, and in uh, in the last 10 years, we have been able to triple our capacity, production capacity and to move from uh, 4 million tons per year to 12 million tons per year. Uh, but uh, uh, we have a footprint in, in all the markets, uh, having access to the five continents, today 31% of the market share. Um, and and uh, we have a lot of JVs uh, and corporations to support our industrial transformation and uh, uh, like our JV on health and safety with DuPont, Duke, our JV on with Jacobs and uh, today Worley. Uh, it's engineering, our JV with IBM to support uh, uh, digital solutions for us and for uh, our uh, like uh, end user, which, which are the farmers, um, etc. So, uh, and just a few words about our sustainability approach. Today, sustainability is an important part of our strategy. Uh, it has always been a pillar, and uh, uh, during our industrial transformation to uh, enhance our capacity production. We try to introduce new technologies, cleaner technologies, etc., uh, with the aim to achieve, for example, 100% clean energy everywhere, 100% uh, 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 use of uh, in conventional water, means uh, means uh, waste water treated and reused, uh, or desalinated water with uh, free CO2, etc., in our operations. So I will uh, have the opportunity to give you more figures our, uh, about our approach to sustainability, and especially renewable and uh, uh, clean energy. Uh, this was just to emphasize how uh, sustainability and clean energy have been a real pillar in our industrial transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Maybe, Terrier, I'll, I'll go over to you. We'll start with okay. the people who produce something, and then we'll go to the financiers. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah, so my name is Terry Pilskog. Uh, I'm uh, heading up uh, product development and product finance in uh, Skatex Solar. Um, Skatex Solar is a company that is focused, uh, obviously, on, on uh, solar energy. Uh, we are a developer. Uh, financer, uh, constructor, and, and owner and operator of uh, solar power plants uh, across the emerging uh, emerging markets in the world. 
uh, we have about two gigawatts of uh, producing uh, energy powers uh, and, and also in, in construction. And in terms of Africa, we are currently the largest operator of sol solar energy uh, projects in, in Africa. We have projects that are currently producing energy in, in South Africa, in Rwanda, in Mozambique, uh, and in Egypt. And we are also developing in, uh, in many of the other African countries. Thank you, Terry. Fantastic. Linda, over to you. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, so my name is Linda Munyenga Terwa. I'm based in Johannesburg. Um, and I work for the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group. So our focus is to provide funding for, well, in my department, funding for infrastructure projects um, to the private sector. So, you know, just for those that don't know the differentiation, the World Bank supports the public sector and we support the private sector. Um, so I would obviously, you know, Skatik is um, a client of ours. I actually don't know um, if, um, if OCM is, is, a, is is a, is, a, is a client, perhaps on the manufacturing side, it's, it depends on which department is, um, is looking at fertilizer and, um, and mining, well, mine, um, fertilizer mining. Um, so for, in terms of the, the scope of business, um, I cover the Middle East and Africa region, um, and I'm the director for infrastructure. So our work includes energy, um, in fact, everything in, in, um, in infrastructure, which is obviously energy, transport, utilities, um, we also do mining to a lesser extent. Uh, we used to do quite a lot of oil and gas, but obviously, you know, things are changing and we are focusing less on that. Um, and um, renewables is becoming quite a significant component of our business. Um, you know, you'll see that we are, we are really pushing um, to support renewable energies across the board in, um, in Africa and the Middle East. Obviously, um, I think Africa is definitely lagging behind, but we've seen quite some interesting projects come out of the Middle East, including in Egypt and Jordan. So really excited to be talking about this um, very topical subject today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Linda. I'll uh, spend two minutes to introduce myself. I, I'm Oli Arav. I'm currently the managing director of a new facility, which is called the Facility for Energy Inclusion. We fund small to medium uh, renewable energy projects in Africa. So what Linda doesn't want to fund, you come to me because it's up to 25 megawatts. So kind of the smaller end of the, the spectrum. Uh, it's part of Lionset Global Partners where we have uh, asset management and investment banking service. I have, I think I'm the connecting link of all these three on the screen because I funded Terry's first project, I think, outside of South Africa, which was the project in Rwanda. When I was in the IF, we were working with you and actually brought time to work with uh, uh, Skatek. Um, I worked for Linda's team for two years before I joined Lion's Head, so, and, and worked on many projects together. And I think even I come from Morocco and spent a year, two years in the last period in Casablanca, I feel also very connected to Hanan and hope to do project work to do it more professionally. So over, over this introduction, I think the first question that comes to mind, and I don't think we can avoid it, is what makes you... Uh, sleep well or unwell during this challenging time and maybe linda given you have just doubled your team almost i think uh, i would really want to hear from you as a leading person in this continent and you know what what's what worries you every day that you you, you go to work or go to sleep and, and what advice you can give some people who probably have a bit smaller entity to run with thanks thanks Oli. so um, i'm assuming that you're asking me what keeps me awake in terms of my team and my work as opposed to i think yeah as opposed to the bigger i mean the world has a lot of issues that keep us all awake let's try to solve something in energy uh, that would be good enough for, for me <laughs> okay so as you say, so we haven't really doubled our team. What we've done is, um, you know, we've added a significant number of people to what we call our upstream team. This is, um, you know, the strategy for IFC is evolving and we are going um, into the direction of really, you know, being at the beginning of projects. So project development is something that we're looking to, to facilitate more of, um, you know, partner with, um, you know, with, 
with developers and other funders to to really create projects and create markets. Um, so to support that business, we we actually added about 30 people during the you know the pandemic. So remotely onboarding everybody, literally hiring and onboarding people remotely. Um, and so from an internal perspective, that is something that is obviously top of mind in terms of, you know, are we making sure that these people are integrating into the team well? Um, do they know what they're doing? Have they got the right support and so on? So that, I think we're doing pretty okay. And um, we've got really fantastic talent that has come on board. And a lot of people we haven't met, which is, which is actually quite interesting and speaks to this whole digital world that we're now living in. Um, so, so, so that's that's the internal, um, you know, issue that I'm that I'm dealing with. But I think it's, you know, it's under good control. Externally, what keeps me awake at night is is obviously, you know, the impact of COVID, and you know what that will mean for a lot of our fragile economies. As you know, you know, if you look at the Middle East and Africa, a lot of our countries really were struggling pre-COVID. Um, the fiscus was stretched already pre-COVID. So now with um, with COVID and the the, the need for funds to be diverted to social sectors, I really worry about what does that mean for infrastructure? Will we see deterioration in infrastructure? Will we see a lot of the progress that, that has been made, especially in, in energy, being rolled back? Um, so, so for me, it's really about figuring out how do we help governments support our private sector partners to stay in those countries, to keep the projects running and to keep the power on. Thank you, Linda. I think that's kind of a good segue to you, Terje. I know you are continuing to develop projects and I'm very curious to hear from you. How do you, you do this? Because we are, remotely it's hard and you also have a large uh, operating portfolio. So again, how do you deal with the COVID impact on the business and any advice you can give other developers who might be on this? On, on finding ways that we can all use and, and continue the good work we all do. Yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, first of all, obviously our first priority in this in this situation is our people. Uh, just important to emphasize that and, and, and sort of the, the health and safety of our people in, in, in our organization and the people that work with us is, is obviously priority number one. Um, and I think uh, what has sort of come as a, as a positive surprise to all of us in this period is how much you can do remotely and how much you can do digitally. I mean, we are we are continuing to to generate energy from all our projects. We have had no issues in terms of the, the continued generation of energy, so, so that's that's a positive. Um, we have also in South Africa been able to commission our three latest projects during this this period uh, and did that together with ESCOM on, on a remote basis. So that is obviously also something that sort of shows that it's still possible to to get a lot of things done and we're learning new ways of doing things in, in this period, which I think is, is sort of a, a positive development. Um, as you said, on the development side, obviously there the situation is uh, is, is different. Uh, as Linda mentioned, there are a lot of uh, fragile countries uh, in this region on, on this uh, continent. And, and obviously in this period, they are suffering more. Uh, and and we, in, in some situations and in some countries, we see that they are scaling back on the initiatives in terms of moving towards uh, green energy and implementing renewable energy. So, so some of the processes that we are involved in have been uh, have been uh, losing momentum if, if I should sort of choose that uh, that language while other countries and this might be sort of also re uh, related to sort of the, the level of resources uh, countries have uh, activities and and and, uh, and motivating and increased activity on the on the development side Obviously, for us as an international developer, uh, we are. Uh, it is more challenging to initiate new initiatives, but in general, where we have already ongoing initiatives, I think that we are continue those. We, in most places, either have our own people on the ground or partners on the ground, and sort of with that kind of setup, it's possible to continue the the development that we have already initiated. Thank you. And then I'm really curious to see how an operating facility deals with and whether you had any challenges on your uh, renewable or energy supply during the COVID as an impact of other externalities. Actually, no, we haven't. We uh, 
Oh, sorry, do you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Okay. So, uh, uh, actually, we haven't uh, yes. a real challenge regarding our energy supply because uh, today 86% of our energy is coming mostly from co-generation and some wind PPAs, you know. So we have three out of four mines that are already covered by wind energy. And in our uh, transformation facility, uh, we use the steam and all the energy generated, which is a clean energy, to produce and co-generate our electricity. You know? So our biggest facility is today 100% covered by our own uh, production. So this avoid us to face any challenge in this period. Um, uh, but if I can say, the, the, we have, you know, that uh, the safety was very important in the facilities. We had to manage uh, uh, COVID distanciation and all the, uh, um, like, uh, yes, uh, what we are supposed to do to avoid internal uh, uh, contamination, etc. This was not very easy, and uh, we set up the business resilience center to see how we can transform ourselves quickly, how we can work from home, how we can just keep the essential uh, teams on our facilities, and how how we can for the first time try to use digitalization and uh, like a. Uh, for shipment, for example, we used uh, uh, our online uh, monitoring uh, uh, existing systems to ship our products without a direct contact between employees and the, and the, and the final uh, and the shipping facilities, etc. So, uh, coming back to your question, what was really difficult is how to stay inclusive in our approach. You know that being the first employer in our company, in our, in our country and having our footprint. So we always used to be inclusive for communities, for stakeholders, uh, for example, for energy. Uh, even if we are working on our internal needs, but we are part of a green energy park, like a park that is developing new technologies and renewables adapted to our context for us and for, the, for our country as well. Uh, it's a cooperation with the energy of ministries. So we have a university that has a department working on the energy. The university is uh, conducting researches on batteries, etc., with most re renowned uh, 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 renowned uh, universities like MIT, Columbia, say, uh, and so on. So we always try to be inclusive. But in this COVID, we had a social impact that, that we had to deal with, with the communities around us. How a big company like us can help people that are, don't have any more access to the market, cannot sell their products, farmers, etc. And we try to, uh, to double effort to help small farm cooperatives, uh, uh, small structures around us to be digitalized, to have access to e-markets, etc. So this was our biggest challenge, how to stay inclusive in a such context. Thank you, Anand. I think this is a, a remarkable comment and intervention, which actually brings me to another question. And, and as we look at energy I, I always think about energy is not a means to an end because energy is, is all our life if i didn't have energy i couldn't speak to you now on the phone because my internet would not work if i didn't have energy i can't have a fridge for maybe vaccine or any other solution so i think if we look at the involvement of africa in the last 15 years in the early days we had ipps and that was the only way to kind of support energy whatsoever into to kind of creating additional energy i think today most of the cities have good access to energy sometimes yes i know we have all the dark um, we have blackouts and i will never forget a, a dinner with an ifc colleague in cape town they call it candlelight dinner and i asked well, i didn't ask for a candlelight dinner i said no we don't have power so we will put candles and and that was a few years ago so i think that but the, the question for me is how do we increase actually access to energy and how do we bring it out to the communities that Hanan just mentioned because without the energy they will have, lose communication, they'll lose other services that are vital to 
everyday life, but I think in COVID time and post-COVID time, it'll be much more important. I'd, I'd love to hear from Linda. Uh, I know she, they have a few projects in mind. Uh, and then also tell you, because I know this CATEC have interesting solutions today to kind of provide a smaller solution to energy. So I think this is two areas from my internal knowledge that is interesting to hear and any other thoughts. Linda. Thanks, Oli. So, um, so maybe let me touch on, on, on one initiative that we're working on that is that is quite important in answering this question. And that's the that's the off-grid initiative. So we call it the mini grids um, initiative. And effectively, you know, as you say, I think we are graduating from IPPs um, to some extent. Not that you know they're not going to be IPPs that are going to be developed, you know, in the coming years. They certainly will be, but I don't think it will be at the same pace as we have seen in the past. Um, and if we're talking about access, you know, the access agenda, and you know, trying to meet the SDG seven, um, you know, and really get as many people connected as possible, we have to think differently. Um, you know, when I look at the numbers, if just looking at Africa alone, that over half a billion people have no access to electricity. In this day and age, that is really shocking. Um, and can we expect governments to continue running transmission lines to connect all these people? I think it's not possible. Um, and it's, you know, it's not possible, one, physically, because I think, you know, you've got to look at the terrain, you've got to look at the spread of the people. Um, but it's also not possible financially. A lot of these, you know, governments don't have the funds to, you know, to to run massive transmission lines and continue building large power plants. So I think we have to come up with, um, you know, the solutions of of grid really um, are quite encouraging. And if we think that, you know, this is potentially a two hundred billion dollar market that is untapped, um, you know, there's a lot there's a lot to be done. Um, what, what we have seen and what spurred on this initiative was that we were seeing a lot of fragmented intervention. So, you know, everybody comes up with their own idea. I'm going to approach this country. I'm going to do three projects here. Or the government, um, you know, public funding decides to do projects, you know, in remote areas, et cetera. So there's been no plan on how to actually make this, um, you know, do have this access at scale. And so we are trying to solve that problem. How do we actually provide you know, access off grid at scale. Um, and it's not a lack of funding. I think if you look in any country, you will find there is some donor that is providing some funding for some energy initiative. Now, if we try and bring all that money together and actually think about a plan, what is a model that will um, attract private sector to help us in this initiative? Because you want to take the public funding that you have and you want to leverage it up um, and bring in additional and, and mobilize other funding to, you know, to help drive this initiative. And also, you don't want this to be a public initiative because we all know that it's, it's always better for private sector to, to, to do this sort of projects, it's more efficient. But, you know, you're not going to get private sector falling all over themselves to do this project if they're not sustainable, if the returns are too low, if they're too difficult, the policies are not there, etc. So we decided that we needed to work through the entire value chain to help Put this program on the ground. So we're starting from, from the basics, which includes speaking with the government and figuring out what are the regulations that are required to facilitate um, you know, off-grid access, whether you're talking about mini grids or you're talking about CNI. There definitely needs to be you know, regulatory changes. To give an example, you know, you can't go and have your own mini grid in a in a in a region where there's no, you know, in, in a country where there's no regulation because what happens if the government decides, okay, we're going to run transmission line right across your area? That means you lose your clients. And what happens to your project? It becomes stranded. So you really need policies that will protect your project and that will allow you to have a concession over a specific area. So that's an example of, you know, working with the government to get the policies and the regulatory um, environment ready. Then it's about figuring out what are the models for um, off-grid that will work because it's not one size fits all. You have communities that have small enterprises. You have communities that are completely rural. Um, so how do you how do you cater for these different communities? So we have to find what is the sweet spot for private sector to participate in. I think pure rural is very difficult because how do you actually get people to pay? So that's where you need heavy subsidies and heavy and heavy public funding. But there's a part in the middle where you've got small, you know, small and medium enterprises um, that can be part of 
form part of your uh, um, clients. So if you if you create a model, if you take that example, you create a um, a system um, that is suited to cater for those for those people, and you bring in the right developers and you bring in the funders, then you can potentially make it work. When we were looking at this, um, it's it's clear that you know there's too much public funding that is not being um, leveraged. So if you look at your typical mini grid, it requires about 80% of subsidies. That is that is just not sustainable. Governments can cannot afford that. So how do we reduce that and um, and make it more attractive to private sector? So you need to figure out how do you actually get you know willing customers, willing payers. Um, yes, it's going to be a little bit more expensive than the grid, but I think what people really want is access to reliable and clean energy. Um, and renewables actually, you know, is a fantastic um, opportunity for us to actually get this off the ground because, you know, you've got, you've got solar everywhere, you've got wind everywhere. So once we start getting the battery technology, I think we will be off to a, you know, um, to a screaming start. But I think, you know, it's, it really is an exciting um, time and it's an opportunity for all of us to put our heads together, put our resources together and really figure out how do we actually help these poor communities that have no access to power. In 2020, it's unacceptable that people have no access to power. Thank you, Linda. And, and yeah, I, I, I have to say I love that pro 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 project and, and the thinking behind it. Um, and, and, and actually, it brings me an interesting question, and Terry, I'll come back to you in a second, because from what Hanan just said, actually, I can see a really interesting dialogue for you, your team, Linda, with Hanan, and look at how their community they have. Maybe one of the, the, the ways to solve or provide additional energy is to look at the IFC big mass clients and, and in the continent and see whether because I'm very inspired from what Hanan said of looking at how to support their community, their of their their kind of clients who who needs it and, and keep them afloat in a difficult. And it might be that solutions like, okay, I have a bit of insight to the mini grid work. Uh, so uh, the team is working on might be an interesting angle to create anchor clients that is very important for these mini grids, but. And then, quick question to you: Have you thought about partnering with somebody like IFC or other energy provider, which Terry will tell you on his solutions? So again, have a bit of insight of very interesting ones on kind of supporting your communities and doing other, not just to helping to because energy will help them. Just maybe my personal belief that once we give energy, everything will change. We will have more demand. The more productive use and the demand will go up once you have scale you can reduce the price if if we want to see the best parallel to this is the mobile telephony in africa when our first project which was celtel in eif went to investment committee our chair of investment committee who used to be the ex-director of ifc told all of us you're crazy nobody will use a mobile telephone in africa I'm quoting this because a lot of people say in rural uh, Africa, nobody can pay for energy. I don't believe this. So I'm very curious to hear Hanan's view because you are very close to the communities. And then Terry, please tell us of your interesting yeah. solution in power. But let's give so, Hanan. So yes, well, thank you very much, Orly. This is something that we are, we are looking into very deeply, you know, because uh, till now we haven't partnered with financial institutions to make energy our clients or our communities. But uh, uh, the affordability of African farmers is our concern. We we started by trying to find financial solutions for farmers to support their agribusiness in general. You know, we have uh, um, different mechanisms, etc., already implemented in different countries uh, in, in in Africa, like the Agri Booster Initiative to help farmers to get to market, to get financing, etc. But coming back to energy today, our most important I think uh, uh, initiative is, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned before, the Green Energy Park. Uh, today, uh, we try to develop solar uh, uh, capabilities training uh, in our country and uh, uh, adapting 
uh, existing technologies to our context. You know that, for example, in Morocco, the atmosphere is very, is very dusty at this impact, for example, solar panels, etc. How we can have exact measurements, how we can uh, help to improve the cost of energy by this Green Energy Park. And uh, after having this initiative with the uh, uh, Institutes of Solar Energy in Morocco belonging to our ministry, we duplicated it in, the, in Côte d'Ivoire today. There is the same uh, initiative in, in uh, the Ivory Coast in Africa to uh, duplicate this uh, uh, internal training uh, panels, uh, solar panel certification, uh, technology adaptation, and uh, and the quality uh, assessment, etc. Uh, so uh, this is not in our core business actually, but this is the way that we commit to help around us to create uh, economic uh, conditions that uh, are uh, that makes energy affordable to everybody and helps to develop this technology in our country, in the African countries in the future. Uh, in, in our solar roadmap, uh, we, we have a strong uh, solar roadmap. Today, as I said, 86% of our energy is coming from renewable and clean energy, and we aim to reach 100% uh, electrical energy, uh, uh, clean electrical energy consumption everywhere uh, in 2010. 30, uh, even if our capacity will increase, uh, but we aim to be uh, covering all our needs from only cogeneration and re renewable energy, but we don't stop to our core business. That's we see the power as, 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 a, as a vector that can develop ecosystem. So uh, we have an experience with that. We, we, we tried to implement uh, ecosystems around our activity before. You know, uh, we import a lot of uh, products and since some years we start to develop ecosystem that can be our supplier and uh, uh, produce what we need internally in our country. And we have the same vision for the electric, for the electrical energy and especially the solar energy. We think that we can develop an ecosystem, uh, develop an, in, an industry, help to have our own producers internally. And this is our aim. Uh, we see uh, solar energy and renewable in general as a vector of, as a growth vector. Uh, today, all the discussion about hydrogen, about green ammonia, being uh, an important importer of ammonia, uh, we think that solar could be a way to uh, transform ourselves to a producer and then to create an ecosystem and to improve affordability around us. So, uh, 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 within the university, for example, we have a very advanced uh, uh, the uh, uh, Mohammed Sis Polytechnic University, just to mention the name, if you would like to have more information, uh, the university is working on on a, a storage technology, on batteries with, with very known companies involved in this sector. And today, all these pieces could be part of the global roadmap to develop and improve the costs of energy and make it more affordable around us. Thank you, Hannah. I have to say this is music to my ears. But um, Terrier, <laughs> I really want you to share with us the, the development SCADEC has on, on probably smaller type of uh, facilities that you can offer, because I do think it's part of the solution to the discussion we are talking about. Thank you. First, first of all, I'd like to sort of mirror the, the comments also made by, by Linda um, in terms of, and, and I appreciate those very much. I think um, uh, our perspective is that uh, if you sort of look at, uh, if, if you look at the continent, uh, renewable energy is the most competitive solution for providing energy under the right conditions. And this is important. I mean, it's under the right conditions. I mean, there are certain things that need to be in place at least from a private investor point of view, uh, in order to 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 make uh, private companies be be interested in in investing into to these uh, installations and and providing energy, and that is the predictability. There needs to be a certain element of predictability, and I think in order for uh, for the ability to provide uh, increased access to energy. Uh, and also reaching out to the to the villages and 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 uh, and and uh, uh, the cities that are currently off grid. Um, uh, the private sector cannot take uh, all the costs. 
uh, and the villages and the consumers can probably not take all the costs. So there needs to be a collaboration between different parties, between the government, the, the donors, the private uh, sector, and, and the municipalities in, in, in order to get this going. So I, so I think that is, that is important. But I, uh, and then I would like to sort of bring two examples um, in terms of showing that there are, there are solutions out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, one example we have is that we have um, we have Guild and we're leasing out uh, a system to a, a UN camp in in South Sudan. Actually, we are doing several uh, several projects for them. But uh, on this specific camp in in South Sudan, uh, we have put together a installation where we're combining solar energy and batteries. Uh, and yesterday, for instance, this installation provided energy from uh, before 7 a.m. in the morning until 10 11 in the evening uh providing uh energy for a camp and, and and through this providing the camp with more than or or contributing with more than 80 percent of the energy requirement of of the camp so significantly reducing the use of, of heavy fuel oil or diesel uh so 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 what's the uh, what's the benefits of this obviously the the un gets lower energy costs because it's cheaper than burning diesel or or uh, or uh, heavy fuel oil, uh, it's cleaner energy. It's always less dependent on logistics, uh, increased energy security. But the most important feedback we've gotten from the people working on the camp is the noise reduction. Yeah, it's quiet during the whole day. So that's that's uh, very interesting. But as I said, with this type of installation, we can all already provide competitive energy for 80% of the energy consumption of that camp. Um, and that takes me to, I, I think, uh, my next point that you alluded to, uh, which is sort of our new uh, concept that we are trying to, to, to roll out for uh, smaller installations. And this is basically one of the biggest hurdles uh, in terms of uh, penetration of solar energy in, on the African continent is, as I said, the predictability and the need from a private investor point of view to know that you get paid over 15 or 20 years or whatever the payback time is of your investment. But what we have developed is a, uh, a solution, which is a pre-assembled and redeployable PV installation uh, that we can install and where we can enter into these contracts and providing energy for shorter periods of time. So it can be, uh, I mean, we would ideally see at least three to five years uh, in order to sort of have some, some payback time on, on the investment. But after that, we are okay uh, if the consumer uh, is willing then to terminate the contract, we can uh, we can then pack up and leave, so to speak. We fold back the, the the solar trackers, put them into containers, and transport them out. So this is a very flexible lease solution where uh, the private sector or whoever the customer is will not have to commit to a 20-year contract in order for the private sector to be willing to participate. Uh, we can enter into short-term contracts, and and that is has often been, at least what we have seen, this has often been the hurdle in terms of being able to come to agreements uh, either with uh, uh, with organizations like the UN or also in the, in the corporate segment, uh, whether it's a mining operation or it's a cement company, they don't have a 20-year perspective on their operation. Uh, they have a much shorter perspective on their operation, and if we then can provide something, we, we are okay to take a shorter uh, perspective, it's easier to overcome that barrier to, to making that decision. Thank you, Terry. I, I was told that we only have like six, seven minutes to go. Um, I think the maybe just the, the last topic, which is, is coming through all the discussion that we, we just have, and maybe we, let's try and be concise, is the future of the IPPs in, in Africa. I think the more I hear about it, and I think they, we, we will see a shift into how they will look, because I don't think government will continue to give us government guarantees and hard currency will not be the only uh, way to fund them or the only currency they will agree to. So I think I'm, I'm curious to see if you have any thoughts about it. And again, Hanan, as, as a develop somebody who buys energy or so, or how do you deal with your currency issues on, or I assume everything is in dinar. How, how what's your currency on your PPAs? The external one, I assume the internal one, you can do whatever you want, but I'm curious if you had any thoughts about 
your 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 ways, and then maybe Linda and Terry can add some thoughts. And I think this probably will leave some further food for thought for our our rest of our audience. Actually, we are aware about uh, the, right. this issue in different mm. other countries, uh, but yes. uh, in our case, uh, we don't face this uh, this this yes. issue. Uh, all our PPAs are internal, so with our internal currency, which is the uh, uh, Moroccan dirham, um, this this uh, uh, shows that there is an important. Uh, a resource and opportunity in inside our country you know that we are one of the most well served countries in the world in terms of solar and energy we we have a great factor of solar and energy resources and we can uh, uh, even develop our own energy but also export energy you, you are aware about all the discussion about previous uh, projects, how uh, North African countries could uh, supply Europe, etc., and how they could develop new uh, fuels like hydrogen, ammonia to export. So I think there is an opportunity behind. Uh, we don't have a currency issue, but we should take the opportunity to provide the, uh, uh, the need of the rest of the world. Fantastic. Uh, Linda. I'm sure you have thoughts on this. Yeah, this is a this is a difficult one, right? And we've had conversations earlier about this, and you know, what are the solutions? Um, and you know, again, the pandemic has brought this to the fore, as 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 the countries are grappling with you know low productivity, which means they're not earning a lot of FX, and the FX that they've got, they want to use for health, um, you know, and other sort of priority social social sectors. So it means that you know you are you are seeing um, a constraint on the on the epic side, and we're seeing it you know in real time. Some of our projects where you know our our clients or the off takers are, are struggling to pay for their IPPs, um, or we have clients that are struggling to um, to externalize the funds right and actually pay their debt. So it's it's it's, it's becoming quite a significant problem. Um, and it, it really comes back to the, the local capital markets. In a lot of the, in a, in a lot of our countries, they're non-existent. There are no capital markets, so you know there are no instruments that pension funds can, you know, buy and and release funds to to support private sector projects. I think that's, you know, that's the biggest issue. So it, so we really are at, at the beginning of thinking about, you know, what are the solutions? I think there've been a few solutions here and there, um, localized. We've seen a, a couple of funds in Nigeria, for example, that are tapping into, you know, pension funds and trying to use that to finance, um, to create local currency, to finance local um, infrastructure projects. But I think it needs to be done on a bigger scale. And we need to put our heads together and try and figure out what the solution is. I do, I do agree that, um, the days of, of doing purely dollar financing or euro financing, hard currency financing, uh, are, are, are becoming you know numbered, or at least the projects will be limited. So we do have to, to figure out the solutions. There are a few things that are out there, but like I said, I think it's 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 time we actually really put on our thinking caps and and start figuring out how do we actually tap into the pension funds, especially for me. That's that's a that's a one low hanging fruit that we need to that we need to to figure out how do we get access to that. And get them to put money into infrastructure because the returns will be good, and it, you know it's part of their you know sort of social intervention in their own countries. Terry, I'm curious. You, as a developer who obviously wants to have certain level of returns, how how, how do you see this, and what 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 something can be acceptable to to a company like yourself? And you work in so many markets, so I'm very curious about your your thoughts. I think mean, first of all uh, to just sort of comment immediately on 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 your question, which I think is 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 partly correct and and is partly wrong because I don't necessarily think it's it's only the the developers and the private uh, players that are driving this uh, this towards long term guarantees and hard currency. I mean it's 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 the whole. It's also the financing institutions. It's definitely the financing institutions. That want to have guarantees for for the for for the debt that they are lending out and and wants to make sure that they're being paid in in hard currency. Yeah. So it's I think I, I, I think I'm it's. Uh, blame. Don't, I, I'm I'm boring to you. To, agree. <laughs> so I think we have to we have to share the blame on that one. But I mean obviously as a, as a private company we are 
uh, we are on the one hand side. We are uh, we are focused on on, on getting uh, getting the payments and, and 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 having a return on our on our investments. Um, currently, I think we all believe that sort of a lot of the infrastructure and and the IPP segment, if if I should call it that, in in Africa, is structured in a way uh, with guarantees and everything that uh, implies that the default rates are very low. Um, so, so, so they are have they are very well structured. Uh, uh, so there are very few states or state-owned utilities that actually have the option to default on the payments under these IPP agreements and NPPA agreements. So you could say that maybe it's overstructured, and maybe both we and 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 the financing institutions should be willing to take a bit more risk and find new ways of all putting together agreements. Uh, I don't think. Necessarily, it will be so that it's black and white, and, and now on the energy sector there will be leapfrog uh, on the on the technology side in the same way as it has been in the in the telecoms industry. I think you will continue to have both, and I still think that IPPs and IPP type of projects, large utility scale uh, wind and solar projects, will have uh, a significant role to play. Uh, they will uh, they will develop over time. You will get storage in. They will take more responsibility of managing the grid. Uh, they will be able to provide more uh, dispatchable power, more loads, sort of even loads over the day. So there's many developments that are going to come. But I think the the key thing is that that we will have to find ways of toning down maybe the requirements that we put back on the on the authorities and and request things that uh, that the authorities and the states are not able to to give. Uh, but as a private player going in and, and accepting payments in, in, in local currency in, in, in some of the Afri African countries will obviously be extremely difficult. Uh, uh, but in, in many of the African countries, it, it is okay and it's happening today already. So, I mean, this is a risk, uh, risk review perspective. And I think Scottex Relied as a company, we have shown that we're willing to, to participate and take a significant part of that risk in, in the African, uh, African countries. But at the end, it's, it's sort of a, uh, it's 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 a col collaboration. It's a partnership between us, between the financing institutions and and, and the authorities to, to make this happen. Thank you very much. I I think we are now eating into the break. So maybe just last final words you want to leave with the audience. But but maybe if I can start actually here. The only thing I'm taking away from this is that we need to continue these dialogues between the industries, the developers and, and the lenders, because I think only by continuing this discussion, we will come to a solution that works for everyone. I don't know if anyone wants to add something. No, I mean, my, my perspective is that, uh, as, as you sort of in, in, in introduced, I mean, the, the, the opportunity on the renewable energy side in, in Africa is huge. Uh, I think sort of, uh, progress and movement so far on a general basis uh, has been uh, disappointing and it's lagging a bit, uh, what we're seeing in many other continents uh, around the world where sort of the, it's, it's happening quicker. Uh, and I think it's it's all about us to find solutions to make sure that we can we can also get the, the green energy uh, transition happening quicker uh, in Africa. And some of the things that we've discussed today is, is is important to make that happen. Well, I think we have a living example that when it's private to private, it happens very fast and to a high amazing degree. So again, yeah. and thank you for sharing. So I think we need to find a way to accelerate uh, all the pa parts that when we have a PPP. Linda, I, I saw you want to say something. Yeah, no, actually, um, Terry said most of what I wanted to say, so I can put a detail to that um, and just maybe just add that, we, you know, collaboration amongst the different parties is, is critical. You know, we need to hear what the developers are thinking, um, you know, and, you know, reevaluate the risk, as, um, as Terry says, which I think is important. Uh, we also need to be speaking to the government to say, you know, this is really an opportunity for you to take advantage of the low prices that we're seeing in the renewable energies. And this is an, you know, it's, it really is unprecedented. And all it needs is a bit of regulatory and, and policy changes. And, you know, I think it's, it's fair to say that the funding is there, the developers are there. So we just need to, you know, get it off the ground. Um, so really, you know, a, a huge opportunity right now. Yeah. And, uh any other thoughts? Thank you. Uh,
question, yeah. I would like uh, uh, to emphasize again the role of the business and private sector in general in this transition. You know, all the business today have uh, the aim to reach the carbon neutrality, etc., and materials are becoming a core important subject in different business strategies. Uh, uh, but the business partnering with the public institutions, with universities, with the research, with the community could be more inclusive and generate uh, uh, like uh, advantages to uh, stakeholders, to communities, and help to extend this uh, transition uh, to the whole countries uh, instead of only focusing on its core business. Thank you so much. Very inspiring. And thank you for making the time today and joining me in my office virtually. <laughs> Have a very good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Take care. Thank you.